Our second reading today comes from the book of Acts, the second chapter. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, make us masters of ourselves, that we might become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire through Christ. Amen. Today I'd like to introduce you to an amazing group of people who lived a long time ago. We don't know their names, but we know a little bit about them. We know that none of them were perfect. They all had their flaws and their issues to deal with. We know that they weren't a select group of people. There may have been a few prominent people among this group, but by and large, they were just regular, ordinary people. But they had something special when they were together. They had something unique and distinctive that they didn't have by themselves. But when they got together, they were amazing. Think of this group of people as everybody's church. Now, here's their story and why we should think of them in that way. The second chapter of Acts gives us a snapshot of the early Christian church. It's just a few verses. It's not in very much detail. But here's what we see we see their amazing worship, and we see their amazing life together. Amazing worship. Here's our time frame. Second chapter of Acts is around 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. And in Acts chapter 1, Jesus' disciples are all huddled together, and they're waiting. They are waiting for the Holy Spirit to come to them, as Jesus promised. In the second chapter of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit does come, and it fills the space where these people are gathered, and it fills each of them individually. And that's when things happen. This is when things happen to them collectively. They gather together, and we're told that they devoted themselves to the apostles' uh, teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And those four things are what happens when these people gather for worship. What's being described there is their worship experience. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching is found in the books and the letters of what we call the New Testament. It wasn't the New Testament at that particular moment in history. They hadn't all been collected into one book, but they had these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They had these letters, Paul and others. And they thought, wow, these are, we got to keep these. And they gathered together and they studied them 
passionately. Worship for them was about learning something, about listening and perceiving the word of God in these books and these letters. So in worship, these early Christians engaged their minds. They devoted themselves to fellowship. Fellowship for them wasn't just saying, hello, how are you doing? Wait 15 minutes and the weather will change in Michigan. <laughs> the word fellowship in New Testament Greek is koinonia, and it means community. They were devoted to having something special together, to having relationships with one another different than the relationships they were having out in the world. They were devoted to developing deep and honest friendships in worship. The fellowship engaged their hearts. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. This is a reference to Jesus' Last Supper. From the dawn of the Christian church, we've celebrated the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, where we've gathered together and shared a meal. For us, it's become something of a ritual, but for them, it was an actual dinner that went on for hours and hours. It was an agape feast. And the reason they did, and the reason we do this now, celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper now, is because on that night, when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it and broke it, and he said these words, do this in remembrance of me, it was a command. And so they did, and so we do in worship, we're devoted to the breaking of bread because this is how we engage our bodies, our physical selves, in worship. And they devoted themselves to the prayers. Prayers for them was not just asking for things. Prayers was accessing the spiritual realities and resources that are out there. They knew that there was more to life than what they could see and touch and hear and smell. They knew that there was more than what was accessible through their senses. They knew that there was more, another whole dimension out there, the spiritual side of things. And that's where they sought to live. And they connected to that through prayers. And worship was their prayers that engaged their souls. They had this complete, full worship experience engaging mind, heart, body, and soul. And what happened is that this is where they encountered the living God. This is where they encountered the risen Christ. This is where they came to comprehend that God is real. This is where they came to understand the God who is God, not just part of their imagination. This is where they came to believe that God had encountered them truly worship is the prototypical Christian experience they gathered together in order to know God receive God and respond to God it was amazing Amazing worship and their amazing life together. I'm borrowing that phrase from 
a book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Life Together. Worship changed them. They did not leave the same people they were when they gathered together for worship. They were transformed. They were made new. And they started to live lives that were different than the lives of everybody else out there. And we have another snapshot of what that new life was like. It says, they held all things in common. And some of them sold some of their things and donated to their proceeds, donated their proceeds. And their proceeds were distributed according to need. This is not socialism that's being described. This is people who know each other's needs, who care for one another, who know they knew their neighbors. And one of their, one of their neighbors had a need, they would provide it for it. They would even lend their power tools and lawn equipment to one another. And it goes on to tell us that they ate bread together regularly, and they went to the temple together. That's interesting because they had their own worship experiences at home, and then they would go to the temple too, but they would do things together. And we are told that they did these things with glad and generous hearts. And what that means is that they were conspicuously happy. These were not downtrodden, defeated, somber, oh my gosh, what's happening now kind of people. They had a different perspective. They had a different attitude. They were conspicuously happy. So much so that we are told that they praised God and had the good will of all the people. The people saw their glad and generous hearts. The people saw how they lived and what they did. We know for a fact, an historical fact, of some of the things these early Christians did. This is documented not just in the scriptures, but in outside sources. In Roman culture, it was not uncommon for children to be abandoned for lots of reasons. These early Christians took them in and cared for them. And people saw that. In that culture, it was not uncommon for sick people to be blamed for their illnesses as if God was punishing them and so people stayed away from them. But these early Christians, they were the first frontline medical workers. They cared for those people and took them in. In that culture, widows were left with hardly any resources. Their livelihood, their thriving, was totally dependent upon their husband or their husband's family. And if things didn't work out and there was a death and there was no one to pick up the slack, it was just too bad for you if you were a widow. But these early Christians, they took them in. And they did something about it. And then there's suffering and hurting people, dealing with all the challenges that we deal with. And these early Christians, they prayed for them. And that made a difference. And people saw all this. People saw them 
with glad and generous hearts. People saw what they were doing, and they saw their authenticity. They didn't only believe things, they were living them. They saw their genuineness. They were walking the talk. They saw, because of them, that there really must be a God who is real and is involved in real people's lives making a difference. They had the goodwill of all the people because these early Christians, they cared for everybody. And what is incredibly remarkable is that this was a radically diverse group of people. Roman culture was very socially stratified. Everybody had their lane, and you stay in your lane, and you don't move across your lane. But these early Christians, they were Jew and Greek. They were male and female. They were slave and free. And some of them were notorious sinners and others were not. But yet they were all together and acted as one. Because the Holy Spirit had come upon them and made them different and distinct. And people saw who they were and what they did and what their characters were. They cared for everybody. And some of those everybodies wanted what they had. Some of those everybodies wanted to experience what they were experiencing. Some of those everybodies came to know God because of who these people were. And they joined them. And that's how they became everybody's church. Day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I have had an absolute blast being part of every day, everybody's church for the last few months. Thank you very much for this opportunity. No, 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 please don't. It, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. This, I've loved the music. Thank you. Wow, it, it's been terrific. And, uh, you know, music is when people like me worship during a service. And, if it's not very good, then I'm thinking about the next thing I got to say or, you know, I wish I hadn't said that or, you know, but, but, but when it's good, it can grab you and lift you up. And uh, that's what's happened for me. So I've loved worshiping with you. And Andrew's got game. <laughs> and speaking of the staff, the staff is terrific. We, uh, we, uh, David Simonelli and I, we reviewed all the staff, had them all in, and went through things and what they're doing and what their goals are coming up. And it, they're, they're terrific, and I want to thank them. And, and mentioning David Simonelli, he's elder in charge of staff relations. I mean, he's going way above and beyond. It's been fantastic, and thank you. And here's how I think of my time here. I, I've been the relief pitcher. <laughs> a fresh arm coming in for an inning or two to close out the game. And if the way be clear, that's how we say this, in a short time, you're going to have a new pastor. And here's what I want to tell you. That means it's a new game. I mean, it is the first inning, it is zero to zero, and it's the first person coming up to the plate. It is a brand new game. And it is much different now, that game, 
than it was when John Judson and I were starting over 40 years ago. When we started in ministry, there was a pretty clear path. Here are the skills. You learn them, go do them, and in 40 years, you'll be retired. <laughs> Not like that anymore. I believe it's harder than ever to do this job. It's complex, and the whole world is in a much different place. But more than that, it's a whole new game to be the church of Jesus Christ. The world has changed. And so now you all have a very important task, and that is to listen to the call of God for what we should do now, who we should be now, with new leadership that's coming on board. How exciting. This is going to be fun, but it's not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be hard. But that's why you're here. I believe each of you and each of you are all called and specifically placed and assigned for this moment in this place with each other to be the church and to do what the church is supposed to do. You are not a business. You are a body, the body of Christ. Business solutions are not the solutions to the challenges you have now. Marketing, advertising, and management are not the solutions. You are not an organization. You are an organism, a living, breathing, growing, changing organism. You are different than you were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Has your mind caught up to what's been going on in your body? It's a whole new game, but you're on the team. So here's my last pitch, and it's a, it's a big fat one right over the plate. You are everybody's church today. Remember who you are. Remember who God has called you to be. Remember that it's all about your authenticity and your genuineness in being the church and doing what those early Christians did. And that is caring for everybody. You are everybody's church today, here and now. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, thank you for this community of faith. Like that original community of faith, we all have our problems and issues and sins and flaws. We are not perfect. We all go in different directions. And yet, you call us together. And when we are together, something amazing happens. Something amazing happens in worship when we are here in this place or online together. May worship change us and empower us to live amazingly different lives. May our life together be filled with deep community made possible through a presence of the Holy Spirit. And so lead us forward. Guide us and direct us. 
so that we might remember who you have called us to be, everybody's church, and then we might do what you have called us to do. May the transition continue. May a new pastor arrive. May there be a warm welcome. And with that, a recommitment to this life of faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's in his name that we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.